Hello, everyone. I want to welcome you to the 10th annual Undergraduate Global Health Technologies Design Competition. We are so happy that you're joining us today. First and foremost, we want to express our sincere gratitude to all of the student teams and judges who have so creatively adapted to the virtual format of this year in light of the unprecedented COVID-19 challenges. The upheaval that each of you students have faced is significant, and I am so thrilled that you continue to prioritize global health and this competition. I think you were asked to submit a video over spring break as you were likely learning that you had to vacate your dorms. That shows me the amazingly high level of commitment that you have to global health. At RISE 360, our hearts are with the global community as we navigate these challenges together. With these ongoing challenges, it is a particularly urgent time to engage in critical conversations about global health. You students are the future of global health and this, in this crisis will take the best efforts of everyone at this competition. We thank you for joining today and we look forward to this afternoon's agenda. I would like to express our sincere gratitude to our sponsors. This program is possible in part by the Stephen W. Lay Family Foundation for Global Health and the Meta Family Foundation. And we thank both of these families for their generous support. This year, we had 18 semifinalist teams from 13 different universities who presented to us exciting innovation in global health technologies. We're particularly grateful to our design judges. We were delighted to have 36 clinicians, engineers, and researchers from all across the United States participate in our pre-event judging for our semifinalist teams. You can find the full list of judges in our event program. From our 18 semifinalist teams, our judges have selected three finalists to present this afternoon. Congratulations to Abibas from the Georgia Institute of Technology, At Your Cervix from Rice University, and Project Alivio from the University of Michigan. At this time, Ashley will provide an overview of the judging evaluations for today. So before we get started with our first finalist presentation, we want to provide some guidelines for the competition today. In just a moment, we will begin with our first finalist presentation. We will play the team video, and each team will have four minutes to answer questions from our design judges. We want to remind everyone that teams were scattered across locations, and many did not have access to their prototypes, so we ask our invite. feasibility of their proposed solutions. Ashley, I don't know about everybody else, but um, right, we lost you partway through. I'm so sorry. Okay. <laughs> so I'll just, I'm sorry about that. Thank you for your patience. Maria, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. We'll just um, do that again. I know that we're navigating some virtual challenges, so I'll try to um, begin again with explaining how our finalist presentations will go. So we will play our finalist team videos, and following the team videos, each team will have four minutes to answer questions from our design judges. Representing teams will be judged based on how clearly they articulate the global health need that their technology seeks to address, their design rationale, solution, and status, and finally, on the technical and social feasibility of their proposed solution. Following our team finalist presentations, we invite our invited design judges to vote for first, second, and third place using our e-ballot system, which we will explain after the presentations. So we'll now just discuss a bit about how the question portion of the event will be moderated. Design judges, if you've been invited as a design judge for the competition, we ask that you virtually raise your hand in Zoom using the raise your hand feature. If you're unfamiliar with this feature, if you click on the participants button at the bottom of your screen, 
a window will pop up and at the bottom of that screen, there's an icon that says raise your hand. If you raise your hand, our moderator, our Director of Development, Karen Turney, will call on judges to ask questions um, as, as we interact with teams. We also want to note that we will be recording the event today so that we can share our team's presentations um, with our broader community. We are so happy that so many of you have joined today. Thank you so much for joining us. But in order to preserve our bandwidth for the call, we ask that we now all turn off our video and microphones as we begin the competition. And if you are speaking to teams, we ask that you remember to turn on your microphone to unmute yourself as you are able. And now, without further ado, we are so excited to share with you our first finalist presentation by Team Abibis from Georgia Institute for Technology. Hello, my name is Amelia Fennell and I'm representing Team Abibis from the Georgia Institute of Technology. In August, my teammates and I visited Addis Ababa, Ethiopia to gain a better understanding of the challenges within the Ethiopian medical system, as well as potential opportunities to reduce the infant mortality rate. In this presentation, I will discuss our development of a means to combat hypothermia in neonates during transport within Ethiopian hospitals. With over 3 million births per year, Ethiopia has one of the fastest growing populations in the world. Although the under five child and infant mortality rates have decreased steadily, the country's neonatal mortality rate has remained mostly stagnant since 1990, contributing 49% to the overall child mortality rate. Thus, the Ethiopian government has identified the neonatal mortality rate as one of the most pressing public health concerns. During our visit, we met with and learned from the head neonatologist, Dr. Azra, at the region's largest hospital. She shared many personal testimonies and emotions and talked about the infants as if they were her own, yet with a detachment necessary when not knowing if those infants would make it through the night. At nearly 8,000 feet in elevation, Addis Ababa has a fairly cool climate. The corridors of the hospital are open air and are thus drafty and dangerously cold for infants transported in just their swaddling cloth. In cases where infants are transported to the operating room and waiting for their surgical procedure, nurses occasionally use a microwave heated rice bag as a heating mattress. But this technique only lasts for a short amount of time and lacks reliability and safety measures. While observing at three of the city's largest regional hospitals, we notice a lack of resources, including medical devices like transport incubators and other portable heating devices. Without these external heating sources, infants leaving labor and delivery become hypothermic before they can even begin to receive the help they require in the neonatal intensive care unit. In fact, a study by the hospital's neonatology department revealed that 80% of preterms become hypothermic and 50% remain hypothermic after 24 hours. Our device aims to combat hypothermia during transport of newborn infants throughout Ethiopian hospitals by doctors, nurses, and parents. The device involves two reusable and cost-efficient components, a wrap to enclose the infant and a heat pack containing a super-saturated solution made of vinegar and baking soda to be inserted into the backside pocket of the wrap. The heat pack contains the solution with a small metal trigger within a sealed bag. Flexing the metal trigger, as shown in the middle video, introduces energy which causes the super-saturated solution to crystallize and begin releasing heat. When it needs to be reused, the pack can be removed from the wrap and boiled back to its original liquid form. The device is lightweight, weighing just 1.4 pounds, and thus can be easily carried with an infant throughout the hospital. Multiple trials of temperature testing were performed to determine the thermal profile of our device on simulated patients, modeled using a filled hot water bottle. The team discovered from engineers at GE Healthcare that a hot water bottle with a certain volume of water has similar heat, tri heat transfer properties to a hypothermic infant. During testing, the hot water bottle was placed in the wrap with the heat pack activated. Results showed that the device delays the onset of hypothermia by one hour when compared to the current swaddling method in Ethiopian hospitals. Additional safety testing and prototype iterating was completed in order to satisfy IRB requirements for clinical testing. As seen in the following graphs, we optimized our wrap, altering insulation layers to prevent burning and overheating but prolong euthermia, the period of ideal body temperature. Results show that the average maximum infant core temperature remains below 37.5 C, and the average maximum contact surface temperature is 38 C, remaining safely below the maximum temperature of 41 C per international standards for heating devices. During our visit to the Ethiopian hospitals, we learned that many of the devices used in the hospital are donated from outside organizations and do not have service contracts. Due to a lack of specialized equipment and parts available in country, broken devices cannot be fixed and are retired to the basement. Unlike these donated devices, our device is made of material that is 100% obtainable in Ethiopia. Furthermore, it is reusable and low cost at approximately $10 per device, making it a sustainable solution for the medical system. 
It is a common occurrence in Ethiopian hospitals to boil large pots of boiling water, which can be used for brewing coffee each day. This provides an easy and feasible solution where the heat packs from the devices can be reboiled quickly within the hospital walls and do not cause the doctors and nurses to change much of their daily routine. In January, our team member Fatma visited Addis Ababa and received feedback from our main sponsor, Dr. Azra. She is very excited about the device and very hopeful for its implementation post-clinical testing. Currently, we are working alongside a team from Emory University to obtain IRB approval to start clinical testing of our device in Ethiopia this summer. Based on the public health interests of the Ethiopian government, we believe we will be able to successfully distribute this product within the healthcare system. With this device, the hospitals can effectively combat hypothermia in the transport of neonates so families can return home with their healthy babies. Thank you for your time and the opportunity to participate in the RISE 360 Global Health Design Competition. We will now open up the floor for questions for Team Abibis. Um, if you'll raise your hand using the hand icon and I'll call on you and please make sure that you unmute when you ask your question. Um, I see uh, Yusuf Yazdi has a question for the team. Fantastic project. Could you say a little bit more about some of the constraints you had besides the cost, including the, um, the weight and uh, reusability, et cetera? Yes, definitely. So um, the three main things that we noticed, one of them being cost um, that we really wanted to focus on as a constraint was also um, the weight as well, because we noticed that they do have a couple elevators, but they are not always working. Um, and so they end up almost always carrying the infants through the stairs. And the, there's seven flights of stairs in the two hospitals that we saw. And the NICU is always on a different floor from the operating room. So they are constantly, or like the delivery room, the labor and delivery room. So they always will have to take the stairs with the infants. And so we wanted to make sure that we had a device that um, was in low weight. And we used the recommended weight uh, limit equation to calculate what our maximum weight should be, um, which takes into account like for how far out the infant is being held horizontally, um, for how long the infant is being held, um, if they have to be lifted, and uh, we determined that it shouldn't uh, weigh more than 7.4 um, pounds, and so luckily we've been able to stay way under that limit um, at about 1.4, and then the other concer concern we had was um, that our device could be found, all those materials could be found in country, because we saw that all these devices that were being donated couldn't be maintained there, um, because they didn't have contact with the original materials and the original company. And so we wanted to make sure that everything used for the device could be found there and could be made and sustained there. Thank you. Thanks, Yusuf. Delphine, uh, please unmute. Yes, hi. Um, great presentation. I had a question on for the, the cooling data. You compared it to just wrapping in the cloth. Did you compare how that uh, how, how long it would take to cool to dangerous temperature when you use the rice uh, packs that they were currently using in the hospital? Um, we did not get a chance to compare to the rice bags um, because we weren't able to get very clear data. It seems like that method there is not very consistent. They don't always use the same amount. They don't always use um, the same rice and it's also some doctors just thought that that was not a good method so we felt like using our time for that um, wasn't quite as helpful for our data because we knew we weren't going to take that route. We did compare um, using some household items such as lentils and beans to see if that was a possible method before we had decided with this heat pack chemical solution um, and we determined that it does uh, it does support supply heat, but not for quite as long as we wanted. It would dissipate after 20 minutes or so. And safety measure wise, it can't be regulated nearly as well as a chemical change solution. Thank you. I see TK has a question. Is that Tiffany? Is that you, T is that you TK? This is Tiffany. 
Thank you so much for the presentation. I think there's a lot of great opportunities for the technology actually outside of probably this one hospital and just Ethiopia itself. Would love to know if the team has considered you know, if you were to scale more broadly outside of Ethiopia, what locations potentially thinking about scaling and how might the environment uh, be different and what are some of the considerations to take into account um, as you scale the, the device? Yeah, I can speak a little bit on behalf of that. So I think upon having a successful implementation in Ethiopia, um, going through some clinical testing and getting some strong backing there, I think it could definitely be expanded throughout Sub-Saharan Africa because much of Sub-Saharan Africa has these same exact clinical needs and clinical problems with hypothermia and neonates. So I think it could expand to similar resource settings where they are, they have limited resources and limited ways to fix maybe modern technology. And so similar environments where they can use household um, ingredients like baking soda and vinegar. It would basically translate just as well in those kinds of situations. Um, we've just decided to go with Ethiopia because of existing contacts between Georgia Tech faculty um, in country there. Thank you. All right, great. I think we have time for one more question, Karen. Great. Roger, we're going to turn it over to you. Please unmute. Yeah, I thought that was a very clever use of, uh, of, of chemistry to get the heating there. And I a couple of little questions. One is, uh, did you track how often uh, these infants have to be moved and for how long? So you have a distribution of, of the times that they would actually require uh, to use this device. The second was, is there any problem with nosocomial infections? If you, you just use one device for one child or do you use one device for multiple children? And does it have to be cleaned? And finally, there must be a seasonality uh, in the temperature. So this would, I assume, only be used in the cold seasons of the year in Ethiopia or in some of these um, Sub-Saharan African countries. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for the question. I'll start with the most recent one. And then our team member, Fatma, who went most recently to Ethiopia, can jump in if she wants. She's on the other line. But so Ethiopia is at a very high altitude. So they mostly remain in the same climate about. Um, in the summer, obviously, it's a little bit hotter, but within the hospitals itself for these neonates, they're still going to be experiencing hypothermia throughout the year. Um, in other parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, it might change a little bit, so that's definitely something to consider. It might not be needed as regularly in those summer months. Um, as for your initial question about moving within the hospital times, stuff like that, um, we've considered when we were over there and our team member Fatma went most recently in January, she did timing where she walked throughout the hospital and went at a slow pace, stopped a little bit to act as if she was talking to passerbys, um, because we have heard from our contact in Ethiopia that some nurses will not be as diligent about moving the infant straight to the NICU. Um, so we've done some timing. So timing wise, getting from labor delivery to the NICU can be about 10 to 15 minutes. But we've also discovered that when infants are waiting, they can be waiting outside the operating room um, because scheduling wise they're a little bit behind and they could be waiting outside the operating room with no external heating source for about one hour so that's why one hour is mostly our reach there and that's our goal for um, extension of heating and then to answer um the other question about using the same wrap or the same device for several infants so that was also a concern that came up because obviously if it was using the united states it would probably be sterilized between every infant, but over there, um, the baby's actually wrapped in like a cotton wrap first before they're placed in our device. So the doctor over there, the head neonatologist said that the baby would never be making contact with the actual device physically, like their skin. And so for that reason, she said, based off their current practices, they would just use the wrap with several infants, no problem. And then at the end of the week, they would just like wash all of them in a washing machine. So. However, it is something we've considered for the future is adding a more um, easy to clean layer on top as it is cotton right now, maybe more of a sleeping bag, outer plasticky layer so that it can be wiped down and sanitized um, or even maybe put in an autoclave of some sort. Um, so that's something to consider for the future for sure. Thank All right, you. thank you so much team Abibis and thank you judges for your questions. We'll now move to our presentation by team at your cervix from Rice University. Hi, we're a team at your cervix. I'm Lisa, this is Lauren, and we're a global health and bio yeast senior design team focused on treating late stage cervical cancer. Cervical cancer is a poor woman's disease. 
In low resource setting, cervical cancer is the number one cause of death from cancer in women. 80% of cases are diagnosed in these low resource settings, and since many of these women do not have the opportunity to be screened and treated early on, most cases have progressed to later stages. Unfortunately, late stage cervical cancer has just a 5% survival rate, contributing to the over 200,000 deaths each year from cervical cancer in low resource settings alone. Brachytherapy is an aggressive form of radiotherapy. It is the only curative treatment for late stage cervical cancer. It involves placing high dose radiation seeds right into the tumor, entirely eliminating the cancer cells. Current treatment heavily relies on the use of transcutaneous needles. These are needles that are pushed through healthy tissue to reach complex tumors and are guided only by ultrasound. The needles pass near vital organs and structures and can easily puncture these structures if placed incorrectly. Overall, the current procedure is highly invasive, time intensive, and requires a high level of expertise to perform. In some low resource settings, brachytherapy equipment is available, but the complicated nature of this procedure hinders any actual use of the treatment. Our solution is a universally friendly obturator, the UFO, which is a brachytherapy applicator with a wide slotted obturator. The UFO addresses the current issues with brachytherapy by eliminating the need for transcutaneous needles and by channeling all the needles to the vaginal canal. The UFO is a 3D printed device with two sections, a top section with an internal template and a bottom section composed of an obturator. The top section has slanted holes for additional needles to reach the outermost regions of laterally extended tumors. It is easy to place and use as needles are completely stable within the device. It is adaptable to varying anatomy because the obturator will come in two sizes compatible with the current standard, 13 centimeters and 15 centimeters. The diameter of the central hole through both pieces will also be adjustable for patients with or without a hysterectomy. It is visible on CT, which is necessary for needle placement and radiation dose distribution plans. It allows for targeted and uniform radiation distribution, which is necessary for patient safety and for the effectiveness of the treatment. And finally, it reduces the injury to the patient by removing the use of transcutaneous needles. We are working with Dr. Alexander Hanania and Dr. Michelle Ludwig, uh, who are radiation oncologists at the Harris County Health Center and currently perform regularly these cervical brachytherapy procedures. Through numerous cycles of consulting and testing with them and our team, we have developed a prototype that is um, effective and fits into the environment of an operating room and also meets the gaps of current devices in this procedure on the market. Uh, through usability testing that mimics the procedure in the cervix and vaginal canal, uh, we found that the arrangement of the needles using our device matches that of the current procedure. And as you can see with this, if this is the tumor um, and this is our device inserted, we reach these tumors through um, a laterally extended angle uh, rather than through going through healthy tissue. Um, we also found that we can treat a nine centimeter tumor effectively, uh, which is appropriate for the majority of cervical cancer patients um, and their tumor sizes. Um, additionally, through our testing, we found that our device reduces the probability of puncturing the bladder and rectum, which are severe complications that often occur in the current procedure. Um, and we were also able to place radiation seeds and cold spots that are currently present uh, due to the current equipment and the device and the way it works. Um, as Elisa uh, mentioned, we reduce the uh, expertise required for this procedure because these needles are guided um, to the tumor, uh, and this allows us to decrease the time required to accomplish this procedure. Uh, it currently takes two to two and a half hours, and through using our device, our doctors predict that uh, the procedure would take one to one and a half hours using our device, which is a significant reduction in time, which is very important for the hospital, the patient, and the doctors performing these procedures so that we can treat more patients. Um, we've created an effective device that is 3D printed, it is biocompatible and printed in nylon 12, which is currently used in many medical devices. And it's also only $55 with the current way it is printed, um, which is very cost effective and important for the implementation of our device in a low resource setting. Uh, additionally, it's sterilizable and autoclavable so that it can be um, reused many times uh, for numerous patients. And it's also compatible with the current equipment, uh, which is the radiation sources and the scans and the needles of, for many different companies um, and different clinics. This year, we have developed a prototype to treat these late stage cervical cancer tumors, and we're very excited about the progress we've made and how far we've come with our device, and we're very excited to see where it'll become in the future and the patients and who we will be able to affect with our device. Thank you for listening. Um, we're so excited to get to show you what we've been working on. Thank you so much. We will now uh, open up for questions again for at your cervix. Um,
We had one question come in on the chat for the team from Yusuf. How does the doctor control the depth of the needle? Someone from the team address that? Yeah, so I'm Susanna. Thank you all so much for um, being interested in our project and uh, supporting us as we try to address cervical cancer issues. Um, so with the current procedures, doctors have to guide needles using ultrasound. Um, and as our team mentioned in the video, the, they are guiding these needles transcutaneously, which means they're going through skin and many layers of tissue before they reach the cervix um, where the tumor is. And so with our device, um, the doctors will still use ultrasound, but as the needles are traveling through our device all the way to the cervix, that, that whole section won't need guiding because the needles are already going through channels in the device that, are, that control where they are directed. And so only the last segment when they actually reach the tumor is when the doctors will have to control using ultrasound. Thank you. I see Delphine has a question. Delphine, could you unmute? Um, great presentation. Uh, similarly, I had kind of two questions. The, does your device then still require some amount of image guidance or are you proposing it uh, to not need the image guidance? And kind of similarly, why is the current method, why do they come in from, from the skin and don't come in from the vaginal canal normally? Do you know? Yeah, um, so very relatedly, um, so the, with the current method, um, they will, they, they use a, an external template that you saw um, held up in the video. It was the blue template with the white stick in it. Um, and that gets sutured to the outside of the patient's body and serves as a grid to guide the needles. But the, around the cervix is a pretty densely um, is a pretty dense area with a lot of different structures so there's arteries and nerves and the bladder and the rectum and other other tissue that um, the doctors have to navigate around um, and so what they current but the current template that they use has been used since the 60s and it's considered the standard of care um, and they don't, there hasn't been significant progress in moving away from transcutaneous needles, even in newer devices that are coming out. Um, so that's something that's really unique to our device. Um, and we do, to get to the other part of your question, we do expect that there will be some level of imaging that's required uh, with our device. We just believe that um, because we're guiding the needles for so much of their path through the body, they that that level of expertise in imaging will re be reduced. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, we have time, I think, for one more question um, from Jay on the group chat. Uh, do you know what testing you have to do to certify it for radiation compatibility? I'll take this one. Um, so actually, since our device um, is just the applicator, we're not um, changing the needles that are used to administer the radiation at all. Um, and so the certifications necessary for radiation apply only to the needles and not for the applicator through which the needles travel through. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think that concludes our question for Team At Your Cervix. Thank you so much, team, for your um, fantastic presentation. We'll now move to the finalist presentation for Project Alivio from Rice, um, Project Alivio from the University of Michigan. Hello. Hello, my name is Anu. My name is Allison. Um, we're part of Project Alivio at the University of Michigan. Um, we're really bummed that we're not able to be in Houston right now, but we're really happy that we can um, stay here and talk to you guys about our project and our prototype. 
So our team is working to build a low cost medical device that will reduce the physical effort it takes for nurses to turn immobile patients in beds. So in low resource areas like Guatemala City, um, nurses in public hospitals are really understaffed and overworked. Um, so this can result in immobile patients not being turned as frequently as they should be, um, which leads to other problems like pressure ulcers or bed sores, um, as well as nurse injury from lifting heavy patients. So our solution is an inflatable air bladder that is connected to a manual foot pump and is placed underneath the patient so that when it's inflated, the patient can be turned around 30 degrees. Um, and while we don't have our prototype with us at the moment, uh, we do have a mini version of it right here. So this is our mini version. This is made out of TPU coated nylon and we plan to have two of these laying side by side all along the back of the patient from around shoulder to mid thigh. And with this, nurses can turn the patient on one side and then deflate and turn them on the other side as well using the manual foot pump. Our foot pump itself is secured to an aluminum base that it will, can slide into easily for security. And it also has a three foot long aluminum handle that nurses can hold on to for extra stability. On top of the bladder, there will be a cover that will be waterproof and easily cleaned for sanitation, uh, sanitary needs, as well as this Boston valve right here that can that is a one-way valve and that can be opened on the first layer for easy inflation and it stays inflated even when it's open and once the uh, foot pump is removed. And then the second layer of the Boston valve can be opened for complete deflation so that when the nurse is done inflating this the patient on one side, they can deflate and move the pump over to the other side to inflate the, the uh, bladder on that side. So the using a pump to inflate an air bladder and turn them in this manner is a lot less effort for nurses than actually physically lifting the patient and using a sheet to move them across the bed. And this also is a much more comfortable way for patients to be turned rather than being lifted physically and shifted across the bed in any way. So last summer, we actually brought our alpha prototype to Guatemala to test with our nurses and doctors and co-design team there. And they gave us some really good feedback and told us that it was a lot easier to use. It was a lot more comfortable for patients to use and that there was definitely less effort to be put in when using this for nurses. And we were actually able to test it on one of our co-design medical students there, one of the heaviest members on the team. And he reported that it was much more comfortable to be turned using the bladder itself rather than being physically lifted by one of the nurses onto the bed. So we hope to be able to do more testing on our device, especially in the areas of weight testing, life cycle testing, and usability testing when we return back to school. So in terms of feasibility, our solution is inexpensive. Um, it's manual, so it doesn't need electricity to run, and it's fairly simple to assemble and use. Um, and when we brought our alpha prototype to Guatemala last year, um, again, like we did receive a lot of good feedback from nurses and doctors um, saying that um, the device was actually around the same price as their current um, solution, or if not cheaper, um, than their current solution of um, foam mattresses and gel pads, um, which can range to like from like 30 to like $200. Um, and they also told us that implementation shouldn't be too difficult as long as we can produce um, good results from our safety testing. Um, and our co-design team of medical students in Guatemala regularly meet with us on a weekly basis and are huge help um, in the implementation process. So despite the small setback of not physically being at school to work on our prototype and our project, we believe that um, we're really close to um, implementing our solution in the hospitals there. So we're really excited um, and thank you so much for um, listening to us today and we hope to hear back from you soon. Thank right, you. Thank you. Thank you, Project Alivio. We are now ready for questions. Um, do any of the judges have questions? Please uh, raise your hand on the uh, Zoom. If not, we have some coming in through the chat. Um, how long will it take to inflate and deflate from Christine? Hi, um, I'm Allison, so I can answer your question. Um, so uh, with no one on top of the bladder, it takes around 20 seconds, and then when we um, tried to inflate it with um, someone around 200 pounds on top of it. It took less than a minute. So it's uh, fairly quick to inflate. And then in terms of deflation, you just have to unscrew the valve and it's it takes like a couple seconds for it to um, fully deflate. Great. I see Richard Jacobs. Rick, Rick has a question. Um, could you unmute, Rick? Uh, yes. My question is, how do you get the bladders underneath the patient? Uh, is that you need a shoehorn or some Vaseline or something like 
yeah, that's a really good question. So originally that was something that we considered, but we really didn't want to um, cause further discomfort to the patient. So the bladder will actually be deflated originally and the, the patient will be placed on top of the bladder. And so um, it will stay completely, um, it will stay under the patient um, throughout the day and like throughout the night. And then um, in the mornings when the nurses come and make their rounds to, um, you know, change the bed sheets and whatever, um, they'll, um, the patient will be off the bed anyways, and then they can just like quickly um, sanitize um, or replace the bladder. And so will you place bladders on both sides then? So yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, so uh, there was, I think, so I'll have a piece of paper just as a representation. So say this is like um, the full piece of fabric that we use, we'll actually just fold it kind of like in half and then seal it in the middle and then there'll be valves on both sides. So it's actually just like one piece of fabric, but we'll have two sections um, on either side of the patient so that it can be inflated or deflated on either side. Thanks, that was very helpful. We had a couple of related questions coming in about how will you clean or sanitize uh, your technology or the inflatable portion? Sure. So we um, will have a cover on top of the bladder um, that will be um, antibacterial and it will be easy to sanitize. We're looking into materials that um, hospitals currently use for um, just like anything that um, the patient will be lying on top of. So we will have a cover on top of it. To add on to that, we're currently looking at SureCheck fabrics that are antibacterial and waterproof and will be easily wiped down and can withstand um, many typical cleaning solutions like bleach or chlorine. Thanks. I see Peggy has her hand raised. Peggy, can you unmute? Hi, thank you. Um, so I assume though that there will be one set of bladders for each patient that needs them, is that correct? Yeah. Yes. Okay, and are these materials that they normally would have in Guatemala so production could be done there? Yeah, that's a really good question. So we actually recently sent a list of materials and costs to our partners. And so they're um, talking to the ethics committee at the hospital and the Ministry of Health in Guatemala to see um, if it's possible to manufacture there. Um, and then while we're trying to, while we're waiting to hear back from them, we're also looking into um, partnering with manufacturers who already use this type of fabric. So it wouldn't be too difficult for them to like um, partner with us. That's a really good question. I think we have time for one more question. Okay, Delphine, I'll give you the last question here. Please unmute. Mine's really quick. What's the total cost of the, the device? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, our alpha prototype that we brought to Guatemala last year was around $30. And um, that was with the foot pump and the bladder and then um, like a basin handle that we created. Um, but with our current device, um, we are really aiming to just keep the cost of the bladder, which is the most important part, to um, under $30. And then um, the rest of the part, which is like the aluminum base and handle, um, that could potentially be optional because when we did bring it to Guatemala, a lot of the nurses said that they might not need the handle or base. So um, potentially each room would only have one foot pump. Um, and then it could just be disconnected from each bladder and used for multiple bladders. So as long as our bladder is um, around $30 or so, um, it would be easy for the hospitals to purchase it, as well as like patients and other people who want to um, use it in their own homes. All right, thank you so much, Project Alivio. We will now move to our e-ballot voting for our invited design judges. And we do want to note here that we understand there may have been some connection issues with um, folks' videos or audios in this. And so we will post each team finalist video in our chat during this judging break. So if you, um, if you did not catch all the team videos, again, those will be posted in your chat during this break so you can feel free to view them. At this time, we ask our invited judges to please vote I'm using the link that's now posted in the group chat, as well as shared with you via email last night. And if you need to retype the link into your browser, it's listed here. We will resume at 2.15 for the presentation of our 2020 Rice 360 Innovation and Leadership Award and the introduction of our keynote speaker, Dr. Taylor. Thanks so much, we'll see you right back.
All right, welcome back. Um, if you're still working on your judges evaluations, that judging link will stay open until 2.20, at which point we will close the link and start tallying our results for our finalist teams. At this time, uh, Dr. Rebecca richards Cordum, the director of Rice 360 Institute for Global Health and the Malcolm Gillis University professor, um, will introduce our keynote speaker and present the 2020 uh, Rice 360 Innovation and Leadership in Global Health Award. Hi, everyone. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here with you this afternoon. Um, I have really enjoyed hearing about the work from all of our young innovators, and that's one of the wonderful things about our decision is we get to see people at the beginning of their careers and all of the great ideas that they're bringing to solve challenges. But one of the other things that I really love about our design competition is we also take the opportunity to recognize the contributions of leaders in the field who really inspire the work that all of us do. And so it's my pleasure today to present the 2020 Rice 360 Innovation and Leadership Award to our keynote speaker today, Wendy Taylor. Wendy is a fellow at the Rockefeller Foundation and she's doing really critically important work for our current time. She's using digital health technologies to predict and prevent pandemic threats. But I first met Wendy when she was at USAID. At USAID, she served as the director of the Center for Accelerating Innovation and Impact. And I met Wendy almost 10 years ago, and she really had a transformative impact on my career. And not just my career, but the careers of thousands of people like me. She and the wonderful team that she assembled ran a program called Saving Lives at Birth, which was a grand challenge program to bring together, build a community of innovators who were de designing, inventing, and implementing and scaling new innovations to improve maternal and newborn health all over the world. And I participated in the very first Saving Lives at Birth Challenge. I learned so much from the programs that were held every year. I made so many important contacts as a result of that. And so today it's really our honor to recognize all of Wendy's contributions to global health. So Wendy, on behalf of our team at Rice 360, who you have inspired in so many ways, but also on behalf of thousands of innovators all over the world, and millions of patients and families whose lives have been improved by the work of that group. Thank you so much. We're delighted that you could be here with us today to address our students. Oh, wow. Um, uh, well, thank you so much, Rebecca. I, that, that really um, was actually quite moving for me and, and means a lot. And, and so huge thank you to you, uh, to Maria, to your amazing team i i think i would just want to throw the 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 praise and the thank you right right back to you i mean you have um you have been an inspiration to me i mean we we uh sort of dove into a lot of our work early on uh by being kind of innovators ourselves and trying to experiment uh, we knew we needed new solutions and and it was really uh sort of brave and and really thoughtful innovators like you that dove in and did it so thoughtfully and and uh, with with um, such respect for the communities uh, that you are trying to to serve and and so I think we learned as much from you as uh, uh, perhaps uh, you learned from from the process and and you continue to be an inspiration uh, you're not just continuing to, I mean, I, I'm always amazed by how many innovations continue to come out of, of your shop through your teams, uh, but you've also uh, been innovating around the entire system and the process, which is, which is so much of the the challenge in getting these good ideas to scale. And so, uh, you all are uh, kind of the uh, gold standard and an inspiration to, to to us all. So thank you very much. Um, 
And, uh, and it, hello to everybody. Uh, it is uh, great to, to be with all of you virtually. I'm sorry we're not in person, uh, but um, I really enjoyed taking a look at some of the uh, innovative ideas that you all have been working on and, uh, and, and I'm really, really impressed. And so huge props to the Rice team for making this happen, even in virtually so you could get uh, really your, your impor important efforts get proper recognition. So on to uh, my talk and uh, I um, have been spending a lot of time in uh, um, all recent days on the COVID response and so ended up less time than I thought to, to pull this together but and I sort of did a, a, a big change in the direction I was going to go after spending so much time uh, on, on COVID innovations and, and dealing with some supply chain challenges. So what I'm going to focus on is, is really thinking about how, uh, and I'm going to see if I can share my screen. Um, let me do that first so I don't mess this up. And go to there. And if I can find the right tools here. Okay. Here we go. All right, we switched gears here. Okay, so, uh, so I'm gonna focus on how do we innovate during a pandemic? And I wanna be able to bring some of the lessons that we learned from uh, innovating uh, uh, and sourcing innovations uh, during both the Ebola and Zika epidemics. So just uh, to start off with, I think you know we've all become immersed in our uh, the current crisis that we all find ourselves in. Uh, across the world, and, and we've certainly heard about the critical need for diagnostics and vaccines and therapeutics to aid in our response, but, but I think equally we've been hearing about um, some huge supply chain challenges in medical equipment, in, in uh, uh, things that hospitals need uh, on the front lines. Uh, we've got broken supply chains, we've got hospitals who are already running low on supplies and they are on the front end of that epidemic curve. And so, uh, and we, we've uh, kind of been watching this uh, uh, pandemic move uh, across um, uh, continents and, and seen some of the challenges that are coming, uh, yet uh, really not at all prepared for, for what we are facing now. Uh, but one of the things that, that we have seen is some really interesting ideas around innovation. And so even looking at China and, um, and uh, South Korea and others, uh, we saw some fascinating things that, some things I didn't even realize possible. There were drones flying the streets in Wuhan uh, telling uh, residents to, to get back home or actually even disinfecting neighborhoods. Uh, there are robots that were not just aiding in food deliveries, but aiding nurses and, and decontaminating hospitals. We saw uh, um, really um, cutting edge technology being used to screen patients in airports and advances in digital so surveillance and AI chatbots to be able to help people understand whether or not they're sick, um, perhaps even aid in contact tracing or uh, uh, actually some interesting things around surveillance, which we may or may not be comfortable with. Uh, but we're also seeing innovation here at home as well. And I actually just read about this this morning. Uh, there was a, a University of Wisconsin hospital reached out to the bioengineering uh, team at uh, University of Wisconsin and said, hey, we are running really short on face masks. What can you do to help us? And this, um, a couple folks there, uh, we're in already in uh, social isolation. We're still managed to get some supplies and did some rapid prototyping, got some quick feedback, uh, had to go back to the drawing board a few times, but ended up coming with up with a really simple face mask that just uses three different uh, types of materials and got approval from the hospital. They produced a, a large volume of them for the hospital and now Ford Motor Company is actually making those same designs, uh, I think supplying 75,000 to hospitals in Detroit this week and planning on producing 100,000 a week. So, uh, so you know, that's you know, pretty simple innovation, but some pretty amazing stories coming out of this. Uh, we're seeing a sewing army come uh, on board, uh, for better or for worse, uh, people deciding that they can make masks uh, all over 
uh, all over the uh, country and perhaps all over the world uh, using designs. We, we don't know whether or not those are safe and there may be some issues with those, but, um, but some pretty impressive mobilization taking place uh, even um, in some cases where it's not been asked for. And, and then of course we're seeing uh, hackathons and innovation challenges pop up. Uh, Mass General is, has a challenge ongoing around a ventilator. MIT has its own challenge going where they're looking to develop a, an open source ventilator for $100. Uh, there are also existing solutions that have been in development for a long time that just didn't get across the finish line. That one on the lower left is from OneSense, which is a ventilator they originally designed for pandemics, but they could never get a, get a real market or buyer for those, and so they had focused on uh, low-income countries. So uh, there's, there's a lot happening right now. So, uh, so one of the things I wanted to do is really think about were there lessons that we can, um, can draw upon from our previous efforts to source innovations uh, very rapidly uh, during Ebola and Zika, and, and, and really think about how we can make sure we're doing uh, innovation uh, both uh, responsibly and effectively, and, uh, and, so, um, and how we can apply those today. So I'm gonna take you back 2014, West Africa. Uh, uh, it, is, it seems a bit like a distant memory uh, since right now last week feels like a distant memory, but, um, but, but back then, I, many of you can remember the world became transfixed um, with this uh, public health crisis unfolding before our eyes. And, and it was really this uh, escalating crisis across three West African countries. We, and, and I remember reading the reports of hospitals reaching capacity, patients getting turned away, increasing number of deaths. Uh, um, and, and, uh, and then, and of course, it hit our own borders and, and caused great alarm. Uh, and, and really the, the fear and the public attention intensified. So um, during that kind of early stages, actually from the, when those first cases really um, were reported and at least officially acknowledged as, a, as Ebola, the US mounted a, a whole of government response to be able to contain and stop the, the spread of this virus. So we knew it was a, a fight we couldn't lose and we knew that the, the best way to control the epidemic uh, and to stop the spread of the virus was to stop it at its source in West Africa. And, uh, and so all of our attentions were focused on that. And, and one, of, um, one of the things we started hearing about were uh, workers on the front lines who uh, uh, began to face a number of obstacles in providing adequate care and timely care to their patients. And uh, one of the things we um, heard about, in fact, the first I heard about it uh, um, in a, a meaningful way was a word coming down from the, the president, President Obama, who, who was quite alarmed with the fact that a lot of the um, suits that healthcare workers were wearing were clearly not well designed for these hot, humid West African climates. And, uh, and, uh, and they were uh, dangerously hot. So healthcare workers uh, would um, uh, you put these suits on and their core temperature would rise. They would start sweating profusely, drip running down their bodies. By the time they got out of those suits, maybe even an hour later, they would dump their boots upside down and, and, and the sweat would pour out. Um, and, and really they couldn't wear those for um, uh, more than an hour or so uh, before they had to get out of them just to, uh, to keep themselves safe. But they also were um, uh, limited, and you can see the, the ensemble here, limited by these visors, these goggles, uh, um, which um, was really their only uh, way to be able to see forward. Uh, and those would become uh, fogged over very quickly, often before they even saw their first patient. And then finally, uh, the third challenge was taking off this very complex ensemble and doing it safely and be uh, decontaminated. And that was really where uh, people worried that the risk of, of, of uh, potential infection for the healthcare workers came in. So it was clear uh, that this was an area that we needed uh, innovation and, and something that, that the president said, yeah, you, you need to find a way to, to help with this. And so um, my team, as we were leading innovation, for global health at the time said, well, we can jump in. And as we, as we started to think very rapidly about how we could engage, um, we also began to hear about other problems. And uh, so in addition to the suits, we heard about challenges with uh, testing, getting samples from those who were suspected to be sick, 
all the way back to the labs in perhaps a central facility that was running the tests, um, sometimes by air, by boat, by um, uh, by uh, roads, uh, uh, and then and then it might take days to actually even get the results back to the patient. And then finally, even uh, uh, communities were unaware of how to protect themselves and their families. And in fact, uh, uh, many communities in the early on uh, had trouble even accepting that the threat was real. So challenges with PPE, challenges with testing, challenges with uh, public health messaging and accepting that that was a real uh, problem facing us uh, may sound familiar to you, um, ironically and sadly. Um, but, but here, um, back to, to Ebola, I mean, this was clearly an area where we, it was ripe for innovation. And so we had had tremendous success with the Grand Challenge model through, with Saving Lives at Birth, uh, which Rebecca mentioned and, uh, and, and other challenges. So we were able to say, let's, let's try a challenge for, for this. And we turned on a dime, we issued a challenge within a week and I can assure you uh, uh, for government, that was really, really fast. And so we launched, uh, it was called the uh, Fighting Ebola Grand Challenge. And we did it in partnership with the White House, with uh, the, uh, the Office of Science and Technology Policy in the White House, with the Centers for Disease Control and the Department of Defense, and all about uh, identifying better tools to help tackle Ebola in, in months and not years. And it was an all hands on deck effort. We were rallying engineers and entrepreneurs and, and scientists and students to come up uh, with new solutions to the problems we were seeing. Uh, and we created multiple ways for people to engage. So, so of course we had the grand challenge where we could issue um, up to a million dollars for ideas, uh, but we also crowdsourced ideas through this uh, open innovation platform uh, where anybody could post an idea and seek feedback on that idea. And it was a really powerful way just to uh, create a conversation in a kind of focused way, uh, engage people from all over the world. And also really what proved to be the most useful in this case was to surface some existing solutions that, that didn't necessarily need a challenge but could um, perhaps be deployed in, in other ways. And then uh, we also hosted our own uh, hackathon or really a sort of a, a brainstorming prototyping workshop specifically around the, the PPE. We did that in partnership with the, the White House. And uh, uh, this was, we didn't just bring together the DuPonts and the 3Ms, you know, the big manufacturers of PPE. Uh, we uh, brought in sportswear companies and, and people with cooling solutions and and makers and de designers uh, into this effort. And, and the most important thing, and really one of this is the most important thing when thinking about you know, hackathons or, or workshops like this, is that we had Ebola doctors who brought that critical user perspective and they were able to tell us the challenges with using uh, uh, these suits uh, and, and were able to provide real-time feedback on ideas as they surfaced. So um, that uh, was great. We learned a lot from that. Uh, but then one of the really exciting things we didn't expect, so there's hackathons and these workshops popped up all over the country uh, to be able to look for new solutions, including one at Johns Hopkins. And I saw Yusuf Yazdi in your, uh, uh, on your chat message and, uh, and he led a really successful one um, through Hopkins, which I can tell you about in a second. Um, but we had 1500 ideas come through all of these different platforms. So our daunting challenge then was to figure out how to sift through all of these very, very quickly uh, really in record time. We didn't sleep uh, for days, I promise you. Uh, but we knew we needed to work faster than uh, the crisis. And so I'm gonna give you just kind of a quick snapshot of the kinds of things that we found. Uh, we invested in a couple of uh, completely reimagined suits, including one from the Johns Hopkins team that came came from their, their hackathon, uh, which you know, completely reimagined the suit ensemble, making it much easier uh, to don and doff uh, these suits and potentially safer for the healthcare workers. Uh, there were cooling solutions that came through that open platform, which we didn't invest in, but we worked with another partner to be able to vet and test the ideas. And, and that partner in Seattle, with funding from Gates, uh, deployed a number of cooling solutions. Uh, then there are a range of healthcare worker tools. And one of my favorites was actually this wearable sensor that could be used uh, uh, in, on patients directly. It was disposable. It could provide key vital signs from temperature, oxygen saturation, heart rate, um, and a number of other metrics. Uh, they could wear it while in the 
red zone and, and it could be monitored remotely by healthcare workers. Uh, but we uh, also saw reimagined care setting, whether it was different ways to cool a tent or rapidly deployable um, uh, kind of emergency um, healthcare units. And, uh, and then um, one of the other things that we really didn't imagine at all were uh, a solution, um, new innovations around decontaminants. And, uh, and we got a couple from that as well. The one pictured here, I called it the um, human car wash. So instead of getting sprayed down, you could just walk into this, this sort of um, uh, small little uh, room and get decontaminated uh, quickly. So we had a lot of ideas come through this, um, but this process, we invested in 14 of them, but we also knew that sourcing these innovations was, was not enough. And, uh, and we needed to be able to, to you know, our real objectives was getting um, solutions into the field as quickly as possible. And, and we know that even under normal conditions, uh, uh, in the best of times, with the best of innovators, there are huge challenges to scaling these innovations. And, and hopefully you all have heard of all of these, but I'll just you know, mention them. Uh, you know, everything from understanding the, the market, and many of our innovators that we have funded across multiple challenges really kind of lacked that sort of skills and resources to be able to understand and identify uh, their target market and align with those market realities. I'll, I'll throw in here also really un deeply understanding those those uh, end users, the customers, um, and the buyers. You know the entire um, you know all of the various players along the way that that have an influence on your product, uh, but also finding the right pathway to scale, and and that's. Um, that's you know, one is even just how to operate in these uh, developing country markets, but two is even just uh, being able to um, to figure out uh, what is the right business model. If you are a student innovator or your innovation coming out of a university, is your plan to launch your own social enterprise and take the idea forward yourself, or do you want to license that technology to someone else that can? Um, and and making that decision um, at the right point in time. Um, you also need to have the right team in place uh, with the right uh, skills to be able to make these decisions uh, depending on which path you follow. And you do need to be planning for product introduction really at almost the earliest stages of when you start development of your product um, and even as you're kind of thinking through the prototypes and kind of beginning that process with the end in mind and planning all the way along. Um, you need to raise the funds which is always a challenge and and also uh, uh, bring on the right partners at the right time. And that can include everything from a partner that might help you uh, uh, test in um, your target markets. It might be uh, that same partner could help you scale your innovations later. It might be a manufacturer that you wanna bring on, on board uh, early on. And so all of those pieces are really, really important. So that can really slow down the development process. But we knew uh, if in this case, as we we're innovating in an emergency, uh, and we wanted to put these solutions into healthcare workers' hands quickly, um, uh, we needed to smooth all of those challenges out and try to smooth that pathway as much as possible. So, um, so one of the things, of course, we did was infuse that quick cash to take the cash challenge off the table. Um, but we also did a whole host of other things from helping our innovators get access to testing sites. So this is that, uh, I called it the smart band-aid, that was my own term for it, but uh, you can see uh, we helped get that um, into testing in Sierra Leone. You can see the individual sitting there was a patient uh, testing out um, uh, that wearable sensor and, uh, and got a lot of really important uh, feedback from that. Um, uh, the other is even helping get critical user feedback. Uh, this was one of these uh, uh, deployable emergency treatment facility. The team from Baylor originally thought about actually using shipping containers to have rapidly deployable uh, treatment facilities. And uh, they're ubiquitous in uh, many parts of Africa. Yet we, they heard very quickly that those were uh, really not easy to move, uh, too big, uh, not nimble. They needed something lightweight um, that could be compact. So they redesigned the whole thing and you're seeing play out right here, a team of four people be able to set up this, um, this emergency facility that uh, could be used very, very quickly and just did it in about five minutes. Um, in addition uh, is building partnerships and here's where uh, Yusuf gets another shout out. So the, the team at Hopkins, developed this really exciting uh, design, uh, new design for uh, the PPE. 
And one of the things that we helped uh, do is, is bring in DuPont as a partner. Um, and in fact, we brought a lot of those manufacturers in um, even at the early stage, so just like you guys did today, we had a pitch competition for many of these innovators and had a lot of manufacturers in the room so that we would have them there uh, at the start of the, the process. And that was, on, I think um, Yusuf and others can talk about how helpful it was to have that manufacturing partner there early with them. And then, oops, sorry, I didn't take that extra slide out. And then, uh, and then finally, um, even uh, working to connect innovators to the key influencers and buyers. So we worked with WHO, uh, they hosted several meetings for their innovators. They brought in uh, individuals from ministries of health um, on many countries to be able to see these um, different products, provide feedback, but also to raise awareness uh, uh, that they, they would be coming down the pike soon. Uh, and Medicine Sans Frontier, which is one of the real leaders in uh, Ebola response, hosted innovators at their mock um, Ebola treatment unit in Brussels to be able to review all of these innovations together and, and see which ones actually worked really well for them. So, and then even beyond that, we anticipated challenges with having to change protocols and, and uh, that would be necessary for procurement um, or regulatory challenges for some of our innovators. So our team uh, was also working on that end uh, to be able to work through those and influence those who are in a position to change things, even going so far as to hire a consultant to sit at WHO to develop some of the uh, new standards around the PPE that would be necessary for uh, procurement. So um, all of these efforts are, uh, really, um, uh, I think, helped move the needle. Um, so I just want to quickly be able to think through some of what we learned uh, that can help today. And I'm going to go through this fast because I know I'm running short on time. So one thing is you know, on, the, on the innovation side, on sourcing innovation, uh, we um, certainly knew and, and I can kind of reinforce that grand challenges a really effective tool at being able to source ideas quickly. It's a sort of galvanizing event, um, creates this all hands on deck moment. And it was amazing how many people were able to, to respond and generate ideas very, very quickly. Um, the other thing I'll mention is that, you know, it's nothing like a crisis to be able to break down barriers in working together. And that was true even within the federal government. And uh, we, you know, this whole of government approach, we had that with a challenge as well and uh, agencies work together that didn't work about, worry about turfs and uh, turf issues and, and everybody can rolled up their sleeves and provided input and feedback and, and, and work collaboratively. And I have to say it was one of my proudest moments working in federal government to have that come together so well. Um, but I also mentioned you know, how you um, ask for ideas makes a big difference in the diversity of the ideas you get. And if we had only done a prize for a suit, we would have missed out on a whole bunch of great ideas. Um, and I use I pulled up this other um, reminder that we actually did a second challenge around combating Zika. Uh, my original intent had been to do a grand challenge for future threats because we we felt like we had proven that we can uh, source innovations in a crisis. But boy, it's a lot better to do it when you're not in the middle of a crisis. Uh, but we couldn't actually get any money, ironically, uh, for uh, preparedness. And so it wasn't until Zika came along that we were able to get the money uh, and we, so we sourced ideas both for Zika and future threats, but um, through that challenge saw a lot of innovative ideas in areas we also couldn't have imagined. And then I'll also mention that, you know, good ideas can come from anyone and anywhere. And um, you know, the Hopkins team um, ended up um, getting a lot of great mileage of the fact that they had a wedding dress designer as part of the sort of wide, uh, sort of diverse array of thinkers that were part of their original hackathon. Uh, you know, bringing unlike minds together can, can create new ways of thinking. Um, but also, one of our most successful innovators came from perhaps an unlikely place. On the right hand side, you see these were. Se uh, college seniors at Columbia University uh, that, that um, developed that colorized bleach, um, which I'll, I'll show you in a second. And, and it's been one of um, our most successful innovations. They created a business as soon as they graduated and have been uh, uh, flying high ever since. Um, and, and here, the Kinos is on the right. It's a, it's a color, colorized additive to bleach um, that you can, can use and make sure that you are effectively decontaminating the surface, whether you're spraying down a healthcare worker or spraying a, a, a surface or even wiping a surface. Um, one of, and so I actually highlighted both of these. These were two of our most successful innovators. Uh, the other one is uh, Shift Labs with just a 
a battery powered drip monitor to be able to control IV fluids. And, and I, I put them up here because as I walk through some of the lessons in scaling, a lot of the things that I will point out were things that these two groups actually got right. And one of the reasons why I think they've been so successful. So here is my top six list um, to run through quickly. So one, user feedback is critical. Always, 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 even in emergency. And, uh, and the innovators that I showed you um, uh, that were super successful uh, were ones that listened. They iterated based on what they heard uh, and they changed their, their products um, um, based on, on that and, uh, and, and really made sure they were designing products for, for the right, um, uh, right users in ways that would work. Second, keep it simple don't over engineer a solution. And uh, uh, that's important um, for speed to market. It's important when thinking about adoption and scalability. And I can tell you one of the innovators that didn't do well uh, was one that, uh, that really was uh, uh, focused more on a lot of the bells and whistles. That's really what they wanted to do, but it was not what the market needed. And, uh, and, they, and they had a, a real challenge in uh, actually bringing that idea forward. Um, but also, um, don't reinvent the wheel if you don't have to. And, uh, and I think that's a good lesson in frugal innovation. It was a good lesson for uh, a lot of the uh, information um, technology, digital tech uh, uh, solutions. There's a lot of ideas already out there. And as we even look at, at solutions today, there may be things that we can tweak uh, much more easily than starting from scratch and, uh, and, so, and move them faster. And then a third partner early, whether it's the NGO that's helping you get access to uh, uh, and get on the ground to test, if it's uh, bringing your manufacturer in early, if you've got the manufacturer at the table as you're going through the design, uh, they may be able to steer you in the right direction so that when you make the handoff to them, they're not going back and, and having to uh, redo things uh, because you didn't anticipate some, some things that they happen to know about and more efficient ways to manufacture um, a product or where costs might come into play. Um, and then um, also don't underestimate how long R&D takes. Um, it takes. It takes a long time for many of the reasons we've talked about. Um, but one of the things I'll point out is that testing in a crisis is hard. So even if you get access to the sites to be able to test, uh, uh, healthcare workers are um, under a lot of stress. They are, they are trying to save lives. Uh, they may be lacking on sleep. And one of the last things they want to do is do research. And it's a real challenge, but uh, for a lot of these new solutions, it's really the best time to figure out whether or not they work. And we need to know whether they work to be able to push them forward. Um, but, um, but it creates some, um, uh, certainly creates some challenges. And then uh, next, uh, markets matter. Markets matter a lot, and particularly if you want sustainable solutions over time. Uh, the two that I showed you, Ship Labs and Kinos, uh, were two social entrepreneurs that very quickly uh, were able to figure out alternative use cases for their products in some of those same markets, um, but they also figured out use cases in high-income markets, so they had dual market opportunities. And, uh, and they were able to then attract some uh, robust uh, financing, impact financing, venture financing as well to move their, their products forward. And, and those were the two innovations that were used in the DRC and the Ebola, uh, most recent Ebola outbreak. And um, both of those are actually solutions that, that may be relevant in the current pandemic as well. And then finally, uh, just anticipate and remove roadblocks. Have your partners remove roadblocks. Have your donors remove roadblocks. Um, there are going to be things that you never thought of uh, that slow the process down. And the more that we can anticipate the entire pathway and figure out uh, what we can move forward, um, the, the better and the faster we can uh, move. And the more chances we'll have something uh, in uh, the time that we need it, or at least will be available uh, for the next crisis. So. I'm going to stop there. Um, I probably went longer than I needed to, but um, uh, I'm going to uh, open it up for, for questions from all of you. I'd love to hear your thoughts and, and, and what's on your mind. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. We are all uh, social distance clapping for you right now. Thank you so much for sharing these lessons and advice. Um, we do now want to open up um, questions from students, from judges, from other guests, again, by raising your hand. And I see Christine has a question, so I'll ask you to unmute for your question. 
Okay, thank you so much for your wonderful um, keynote speech. Um, when you're when gathering uh, user feedback and um, determining partners, how do you decide on what markets to enter? Like how big of a scale is too big or too small? What are your deciding points for that? Um, I, I think, and, and it's, a, it's a great question because I can tell you even from innovators that we worked with in the past, it's really important to choose your initial target market. Um, so you, um, I'll, I'll give a couple of thoughts. I know uh, members of my team that worked really closely with a lot of innovators would probably have, had, um, have other ideas to, to add to this, but I can tell you that, that you know, one is you want to be able to get into a market um, and get into somewhere where you can actually test your product um, with and, you know, in the kinds of settings where you want to use it. Um, and, uh, and, and you're in doing so, you're building the local connections, you're building connections with uh, and if we're talking developing countries with the Ministry of Health, that, that may be critical for scaling those innovations. And, uh, and we did see a few innovators find some partner just because they had a relationship. It might not have been the right testing site. There might have been conditions in that country that were really not amenable, whether it's policies or, you know, um, or the number of patients that they needed in a particular area. So, um, so they, you choose your site poorly, it can be a real challenge for testing. Um, but also, um, you, it helps, uh, you're building a lot of uh, goodwill and buy-in to be in a place where you have a chance of actually scaling well um, initially. And, and so you really have to think through not just where's the best place to test, where can I build partnerships and relationships and where could I potentially um, uh, uh, not just develop that proof of concept, but even get some um, kind of ground um, you know, lay some ground in terms of scaling that innovation. So it requires thinking it through um, uh, multiple steps ahead. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I know that Scott Key has a question. Scott, can you unmute? Yeah, hello. Hey, my name is Scott Key. Uh, I run a social <laughs> enterprise that actually has been awarded USAID DIV funding in the past. Um, my question is about procurement and your presentation. Uh, it seemed like there were a lot of idea fest, uh, idea uh, opportunities, but then procurement seemed to go very often to groups like DuPont. And I guess my question is, how can USAID and other institutional groups help guide young social enterprises that don't want to license their technology and actually want to take it all the way? Yeah, and and I will say, well, um, DuPont didn't actually. Um, uh, end up moving that innovation uh, uh, forward uh, for a host of other reasons, but um, but I you know I think one of the things that USA did when 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 I was there uh, was really be able to open up uh, in open up opportunities for innovators for social entrepreneurs that were not the big players to be able to compete and move their ideas forward. And we created uh, accelerators to be able to help a lot of the smaller social entrepreneurs who are kind of new to this be able to figure out uh, and find their way through the process. And, and DIV, which you mentioned that at, at Development Innovation Ventures is, was one of those mechanisms that was really intended uh, uh, like brand challenges to not just give money to the usual suspects, the big players, but to, to open it up. And I, and, you know, I think, some of that has continued under uh, USAID under this new administration. And, and I think those kinds of efforts, you know, in my view, um, our efforts to do that, to open it up to a whole new uh, range of solvers, um, new entrepreneurs and innovators has, has really opened up the landscape. We've built entirely new um, creative pipelines and solutions that, that um, uh, have, have changed landscapes and are changing lives. And so, um, so I'm, this is my way of saying that, uh, that I think the process has switched a lot uh, toward innovators like you. Uh, that is not to say it's not still hard. I know that the, um, still the funding out there is still, uh, feels few and far between and we need a lot, a lot more of it. Uh, but but keep, keep at it, um, it's really important. Karen, I think we have time for one more question. Wendy, are you are you back? I'm here. No more questions? Can you guys hear me? 
I'm sorry, we have one more question. I think I got kicked off somehow. Roger has a question. Go yeah, ahead, Roger. Wendy, I thought that was a terrific presentation with all the ways that innovation can be brought into a problem like that. We're, we're involved now, enmeshed in this COVID outbreak, and there are gonna be hackathons coming insights into how to do that or experience that you brought from your other hackathon to something like this that's going to be occurring now and probably uh, in the near future. Lessons learned, I would guess. And the use of local people, because most of the problems that we're, we're interested in what's happening in Africa, and much of the innovation will have to come locally, but with some stimulus from outside, whoever has good ideas. Give us your thoughts of how to do that. And I, you, you cut off a little bit, but you're, you were asking, um, yeah, and is that Roger Glass that I recognize your voice? Yep, yep, it's amazing. <laughs> Okay, hi Roger. Um, so, so you're saying you all are thinking about for COVID um, potentially doing hackathons or challenges, and particularly you're thinking about developing countries. Yes, exactly. In, in Africa, we're really concerned about Africa as the next frontier. This, how, how do you organize this? How do you go about it? Yeah, I mean, so one of the things with, with the grand challenge is, and the beauty of it is you can sort of move fast and put out a call, uh, design it well so you get lots of different ideas. You, you say that you're interested. It, it, this could be a, a, a grand challenge that's issued for COVID that is a partnership with, with NIH and you know, other parts of HHS, CDC. You could have USAID as part of this. You could have the um, Office of Science and Technology part of it and a signal that you're interested in solutions both for de developing countries with low resource settings as well as um, uh, solutions here in the US. And, uh, and you're looking for a range of different solutions. And so my, my um, suggestion is one is to cast a broad net because there are, there are ways, there are solutions that you might not have thought about and uh, and then you you also have to think about there might be things that um, that would have worked really well in um, you know, before but when we're not in the social isolation word will world so how do you do hackathons when you can't put everybody in the same room together there might be ways to still do it um, and ways to organize the thinking there could also be um, uh, you know you want to be able to get ideas and think about um, if there are supply chain challenges, how, are there solutions that developing countries can either develop on their own or using open source innovation can manufacture on their own, or they could um, develop them sort of um, kind of for, uh, you know, so continent wide um, and, and share across. So, so I think, um, and I'm happy to have conversations with you offline to, to think about how to how to do that and how to draw lessons. It is, um, I think it would be a great idea uh, uh, to be able to think about where's our role for innovation. Um, in addition to thinking about what are, what are some open source solutions where we just need to actually have market shaping solutions to incentivize local manufacturing because we're never gonna be able to get the supplies there because the supply chains are broken or our planes are not moving or whatever it is, we have to anticipate further shutdowns. And so, um, so it's, it's, it's gonna require a lot more creative thinking, but I think it would be a, um, an important effort to move very quickly on and, and you might get some great ideas. Thanks. Sure. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Taylor, for your incredible keynote. Um, at this time, we will move to announcing our finalist team awards. And thank you all, great to see you. Thank you so much, Dr. Taylor. All right, it is now our joy to announce the uh, finalist team awards. Um, we ask that as we announce our team awards, if our teams can turn on your video and microphones as your awards are announced so that you can virtually accept your award. And we will note that our awards will be mailed to all teams following the competition. So without further ado, I'll also just add one note. We were really excited. We had 30 judges submit evaluations today for our finalists. So thank you again to our judges for your incredible contributions today. And thank you to all of our teams for sharing your innovations with us. It's been a really, really encouraging and powerful afternoon. All right, without any further ado, we'll announce our third place team, which is 
Project Alivio from the University of Michigan. We're all giving you a virtual applause from uh, everywhere that we're joining today. All right, we'll now announce our second place team, which is team at your cervix from Rice University. Congratulations. And our first place team today is team Abibis from the Georgia Institute of Technology. And can we ask our teams to turn on your videos if you're able? <laughs> Wonderful, congratulations to all of our teams. And now we're gonna try something um, new on our virtual format. It's really powerful, this event, to bring together um, such an amazing global community. We have colleagues joining us from all over the United States today. We have student teams from our semi-finalist groups um, joining from Ghana. We have some colleagues from Tanzania. So we're very encouraged by this bringing this global community together. And so now from all over, where we're all joining remotely to be together virtually, we'd like to give a big, warm, round of applause virtually to our team. Thank you all so much again for joining today. This concludes our program. Take good care.